So my name is Armin Ronacher, and I have created a bunch of Python projects, which I got well known for. Um, and they are now living under a new umbrella organization called Palettes. And these are like Flask, Werkzeug, Ginger, and a few others. Um, and I have been doing Python for, I think, the majority of my programming years by far. Um, and Python is still my day-to-day -day activity. I work for Sentry now, which is an open source company. Um, and we built a tool called Sentry. Um, and it's almost entirely written in Python. Um, and so whenever someone invites me to a conference, one of the tricky things is that I used to do a lot of active Python development for, um, in, in terms of libraries, but I even used to contribute a little bit to the language itself. Um, and I don't, have, I don't do that much more in, in the Python community. So it's always kind of tricky um, to come up with something that is worth sharing. Um, and so the, the, the title of this talk is basically a future Python or a Python future, which is sort of how I envision a Python could look like. Um, but I'm not a Python developer in the sense that I could drive the language forward. So what can I actually tell you? Um, what I can tell you is my ideas of how I think Python could work and what we could do as a community and as the core developer language to move it forward into a different future. Um, and but this is obviously going to be primarily based on what I think. It, it's it's kind of tricky for me to say like this is how it should go because I'm I don't have like any authority in this. Um, but I I can tell you what I wish it would be based on my experience and based on experiences I made in some other communities. And one thing is very clear that Python is at a big turning point. And the reason for this is that the future of Python will be very different from what it has in the past, because we this year, we basically had this happening. Um, Guido van Rossum stepped down as the benevolent dictator of life, uh, which thankfully didn't involve murdering him. Um, but it's clear that we, we are now at the point where um, the way the language is going to evolve is different. So what does this mean? And in, primarily, if, if it means that the way the language or the way the community is going forward will, will change. Um, it's important to understand how did we even get to this point. Um, so if, if someone needs to replace Guido, uh, under, under which mode will this person operate? Um, so where are we now? Um, where we are now is we have a very successful programming language, which a lot of people appreciate. Um, but many of us don't even know why. Um, there, there are some certain qualities that people attribute to Python, and I think they're generally relatively well understood. There's this idea of Pythonic, um, but it's very tricky to understand what this means in detail. Um, and more importantly, it's, it's kind of hard to understand like why are we at this point where there are conferences in all over the world, where there are thousands of developers. Um, so it's, under, it's important to understand how we get to this point. Um, and I think the main reason we got to this point is because there's something in the language that people really appreciate. Um, and this is something that you can um, measure on a somewhat scientific level. Um, and, and this is, this is the, study, the, um, the annual survey on Stack Overflow. Um, and if you look by most loved languages, Python is in the top three. Um, and it's also the only language in the top three which is widely used. Um, it's, it's not that hard to be a beloved language if most of the work in that language is, is on a hobby level. So I think Rust, which is sort of, this is my refuge in, in many ways, which is what I'm doing a lot of my time. I think a lot of the reasons why people love that language is also because people use that language in, in many ways for their hobby projects. But people use Python also for a lot of commercial work. So the fact that we are that far up in this list is, is very encouraging. And more importantly, there are many, many people that want to use the language which haven't used it so far. So it's, it's the top most wanted language that people would like to program in on Stack Overflow. And this is, this is going for a couple of years now. So this is, this is not an outlier this year. This is, this is something that has been happening. Um, so we did something really right um, from probably the combination of the language design and the way the community approached it. But we need to look forward. <laughs> and in order to look forward and see what the future can bring, I want to 
bring, make a little detour to somewhere else entirely. Um, I mentioned earlier that I used to do a lot of Python development. And this has not really changed that much in the sense that I still do a lot of Python development. But if I would split my work um, in, in, in Python technology, I would say that Python is now a third. And the, the, the other part of it is, is both Rust and TypeScript. Um, and so I want to show you this little thing here. This is um, a crab. Uh, and this crab is the informal community logo of the Rust community. Um, so this is the Rust logo. This is the Rust programming language. And this is probably, the, for me personally, one of the most important things that happened in, in open source um, in, in a very long time. Um, and m primarily because of this crap. Um, because of the crap, uh, the crap is basically, uh, it's a pun. It's in a similar way as the Python community uh, has used to have or still has lots of puns in uh, going back to the, uh, the Monty Python. Um, sorry, there's a phone going off. Um, the same way as Python had a lot of um, puns going back to Monty Python, um, Rust has this pun with the crap. Um, and the reason why they have this crap is because when Python developers call themselves Pythoneers or Pythonistas, um, uh, Rust programmers call themselves uh, uh, Rustus, Rustacans, I guess, like like Crustacan, the, the, an animal that has a crust, like a crab. Um, and this came out of the community. So the community embraced this idea of, of, of finding, um, finding a logo for it, finding, finding a community animal, a symbol for it. Um, and this is also now, I think, the animal that, that moved to, it is on the books and, and, and the, the, especially the O'Reilly books. Um, so this, is, this has become the symbol of the language. And I think it's important to understand that this is not something where there was a person that invented the crap, probably that happened to some degree, um, but it's something the community embraced. And so the community aspect has been the, one of the most interesting things in, in Rust for me. And interesting because Rust as a language is ridiculously hard. It's, if, if you would take all the programming languages you could find um, that have any sort of traction going on, Rust is probably very high up there. Um, it's, it's a very complex internal language. It's really hard to learn. Um, but for some reason, people push through it and actually do something with it. Um, and how can it be that it's one of the most loved languages? Is it so hard? This seems to be unintuitive for Python developers. Because I think if you would survey people on why they love Python, simplicity and, and how easy it is to get started is, is a big part of it. Um, more importantly, it's not just hard. It's really complex. The, the, the surface of the language is probably one of the most complex that can you find. There is, um, there is a very complex type system in it. There is this idea of borrow checking. There is no garbage collector. It's, it, it's about as complex a language could be, both from, 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 from what you have to understand and from how the compiler and, and everything with it works. So how could it be that people love Rust? Um, and so this is, this is something that I spent a lot of time thinking about because I wanted to understand why, why do I love it? Like, what is it that makes me so excited about it? Um, and, and why do I not have necessarily the same excitement about Python? Um, and this is weird because I used to have, I used to feel very much the same about Python as I now feel about Rust. Um, and so this is, this is what I think made me very interested in it. The biggest one is packaging. Um, this is, I mean, <laughs> It's interesting because packaging is, in a way, a solved problem. Um, most languages have a, a way to, and by packaging, I mean depending on other packages, like installing the Flask framework, for instance, on Python, there would be a package. And Rust has a very good story for this. It has a tool that comes with the language. It's embraced as part of the documentation. You just say, I want to depend on this web framework, and then it's there, and you can start using it. You can share your dependencies uh, with the writer community, so it's, it works. Um, and in a way, the, this is also something that came out of the community. It wasn't, the developers themselves did not say, let's build, um, let's build a, a, a package manager. That's not what happened. What happened is that people from, in this case, 
the JavaScript community came to Rust and implemented, or in a way, JavaScript slash Ruby community came to Rust and said, let's, let's make sure this language has a package manager. But it didn't just create a package manager um, in the same way as, for instance, the package manager appeared in Python. Um, it became part of the language. So pip, in many ways, is still a separate thing. While Python 3.5 and later, I think, can automatically install pip for you, it's, it's still two different communities. There's the core language development, and then there is, um, there is pip. Um, and so in Rust, it started the same way, but it converged into one package. Um, and so the packaging story in Rust is very powerful and, and generally very well received. Um, it's not just packaging, though, that works really well. It's also distribution. And I think this is the part that excites a lot of people about it, is that you compile your Rust application into a binary. You give it a random person. They can run it. Um, this is also something that I remember when Go came out as a language was a huge driving factor for it. You could just compile it, and it runs. Um, I, I, I have this had for many years where people ask me, how do I make my application be something I can distribute to to like a consumer or a customer. And in many cases, the answer has always been, well, it depends on what you want to do. They can do this or this or this. And none of those were really, really good solutions. And then it has been sort of put under the rug a little bit, because now you can ship Docker images to people. Um, but there has never been a really good answer to distribution in Python. And this is something that Rust has a really good story on, um, to the point now where you can see Rust libraries having websites where you can use the Rust module in the browser because they compile to WebAssembly. So the, the distribution doesn't just stop at distributing binaries to, to customers. It, it goes to distributing web assemblies running on the web. Um, so this has been, I think, one of the largest reasons people are interested in this. And this turns out to be also what I think fundamentally was why I was interested in it. Um, and reliability and trust. And I will have more on that later, because I think it's also important that this is something that I think people are fundamentally also attributing to Python. Um, I remember that when the Python web frameworks became popular in sort of the newer ones, like Django and Flask, when they became really popular, one of the sort of underappreciated parts of it was that as your application server was running, it wasn't doing anything crazy with your memory consumption. It might have a certain memory footprint, but it didn't require tweaking your garbage collector. Maybe to some degree it did. But for the most part, if you have a Python application that runs somewhere, it keeps running. And you can trust it a lot because you can introspect what it's doing. Um, so a lot of tools, like for instance, the company I work for called Sentry, came out of this ecosystem of the idea that you can look at your interpreter and see what it's doing. Um, and you can report failure states into a centralized system, or that you could connect to your interpreter and figure out what it's doing right now. So this is something that very few languages have achieved. The, the idea that you can trust both the developers of the language to do something in the right way, but also to trust that the interpreter is performing in a, in a really good way. Um, we Both Rust and Python did not necessarily suffer from some of these um, common cases where um, people wanted to rewrite the service purely on, 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 on the way uh, garbage collection worked. Um, obviously, Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, but even in Python, there are many people that really value this, this reliability of it. Um, and lastly, in regards to what, what makes people very interested in Rust is the idea of zero-cost abstractions, the idea that you can build a beautiful API, and it's free or almost free. Um, and I think beautiful APIs is, is something that people attribute to Python as well, the idea that you can write really nice looking code. Um, the problem with this has been that a lot of these really nice looking libraries come with an overhead in Python. Um, and so I, I personally, for instance, I always felt a little bit frustrated by the fact that if I want to make a, a nicer API, I always have to pay something for it. Um, for instance, I love SQL Alchemy. I think it's one of the best SQL systems that any programming language has. Um, and it frustrates me internally so much that I know what overhead is involved in getting this going, because we are limited by what we can do in terms of abstractions um, that doesn't incur any cost. Um, and so it's, it's very liberating, in a way, to try to build perfect APIs in Rust, because I can move a lot of this stuff out of the, the pure execution into a compiled step. 
um, that, that will be fully eliminated at runtime. And, and this is a very important topic for me because I'm outspoken about um, not appreciating the way Python 3 was handled. Um, this is something that Rust learned from Python. It learned that it's, you, you need to have a story for breaking backwards compatibility. And Rust does break backwards compatibility, but it does it in a way where new code and old code can coexist and call each other. Um, and this is, I think, the, the way they have done this, I think, is if we're going to do a Python 4, this should probably be a guiding principle in, in how they're doing this. Um, any syntax change can be uh, opted in by switching the addition to the new one. Um, but this also goes beyond syntax. It goes into behavior of the import system and things like this. Um, so this, this, the fact that they had this story um, is, for me, was a big part. Um, lastly, though, and I think this is, this is actually the core of this talk, is, is the community. Um, the community aspect of Rust is the, the, is the core of what makes me stick to the language. There was a lot in Rust where I felt like this is, this is not working because it's too complex, it's too hard. It's, I, I don't even know if it's going to stick around in three years or so. Um, but the fact that this community stayed around demonstrated that it can evolve the language in ways that the developers that use the language really appreciate and that the developers that develop the language can get behind on um, was, is a very strong uh, motivating factor. And this is, this is the part where ultimately I think um, we as the Python community actually need to improve. And I will go into this quite in a bit. Um, so one thing that Rust did very well is that it tells you a story. If you, if you download Python today, for instance, and you go to the website, it will not tell you anything about the language. And that's probably fine because Python is established. You probably already know what the ideas of Python are. But then you go to the documentation, and it doesn't tell you what the values of Python are. It, it gives you some abstract ideas of what you could use it for. Um, and you actually figure out that not necessarily all of the ideas that the Python documentation tells you about how to use the language actually mirror what the community on, on a wider scale thinks about how to use the language or what, what, what the pillars of it are. Um, and this is very different than Rust. I think we should move towards this point. Rust's values are very transparent. Everybody, be it the core developers or be it the wider community, have a really good understanding of what does it mean for this language to exist and what are the, the pillars that define it. Um, so I, this is a quote from the book, uh, the Rust Programming Language book. It's called, um, it's, it's the, basically the introduction to the book. And it says, the Rust Programming Language is fundamentally about empowerment. No matter what kind of code you're writing, Rust empowers you to reach farther, to program with confidence in a wider variety of domains than you did before. And I find this to be one of the best introductory sentences you can give to a language because it tells you something about it. It tells you that the, the, the developers of the language, or who, at least who wrote the book, and it turns out that is the same values everywhere, um, care very much about giving the programmer power to solve their problems. Um, and in, in ways, and, and this is what the language is attempting to do, in ways that goes further than other programming languages did before. Um, and in, in areas where ne not necessarily you would expect that programming language to be. So this, this, this statement tells you also why you can use Rust in a browser. Because it's a goal of the language to run in domains that you haven't expected before. Like, why wouldn't you compile your Rust code to the browser? On the other hand, it has never been really a goal of the Python community to put this into their mission statement in a way. Like, yeah, you could kind of run Python on a lot of platforms, but nobody ever wrote in and said, like, we absolutely need to do this. One of our goals is to run everywhere. Um, it wasn't a thing, um, and it's, it's not a guiding principle. Um, but Rust also shows you that it's OK to create something really complex for as long as using it is simple. Um, and this is, I think, one other part that we as the Python community either, and I want to clarify one thing here. When I talk about Python community, I don't know what it is. Because as far as I can tell, there are many different communities where their interactions are sometimes unclear. So for instance, there's the Django community. And the Django community has relatively good 
alignment between the Django core developers and the wider Django ecosystem and the people ultimately programming within the Django framework as users. Um, and then you have a similar thing in the Rust uh, ecosystem, uh, sorry, in the Flask ecosystem. The, the, what people use Flask for is more or less what the framework was developed for. Um, and I think the same applies to scientific Python as well. But then you get to the point where the Python community also involves the Python core language development. And I think at this point, there is not a lot of alignment, actually. Um, and I have some examples of why this alignment doesn't exist at all. Um, and this, this, is, this is what I, I think want to go mostly towards, is giving you an understanding that um, our approach so far succeeded <laughs> despite our process more than because our process is really good. And now that I think, um, I, I, I mean, I don't know how well this is generally understood, but I think from a lot of Python core developers, there's an understanding that how the language is evolving wasn't necessarily always going in the best ways. And I think ultimately this is, I mean, if you have seen the conversations about um, Guru's departure, you know that there was a lot of uh, emotion involved in this, and not necessarily the, the happy emotions. Um, and so I, I would point this at, there seems to be, and I don't know how, how well this actually reflects reality, but this is, this is what ultimately drove me away from the language development, was that I felt like there's the wider community that has one idea about the language, and then there's the core development of the language, whatever that means. That's not just core Python developers on the interpreter. This is also people very close to, to the language development. They, they, their goals are not necessarily aligned, and in fact, are very unaligned. Um, there are many tools, for instance, PIP and VirtualEnv, which were developed by the wider community, which were completely rejected by the core of the language development. Um, it took, I don't know, more than 10 years for when the community was already using PIP and VirtualEnv for the official Python documentation to even acknowledge that those tools exist. Like you couldn't go to the Python documentation and it would tell you, install virtual env, this is how it works, here's how you install your package. It was just not existing. Um, and this is, this is very telling because a lot of the times when a community builds something that got widely appreciated, on the way closer and closer to the language, it changed. Um, the, the, the way the, the daytime module ultimately came from the community, but instead of the daytime module being the community package being added to the standard library, it was rewritten on the way to the standard library and changed entirely. Um, there, was, um, there is still a community package called Atters, which lets you attach attributes to classes in different ways. On the way to the standard library, it got rewritten and is now called data classes. And if you Google the, the, the aspect in which this, this happened, there were a lot of, I, I would say, bad blood um, involved in this. Um, same way we, we got async I.O. into the standard library, which I appreciate and very much value that it's there, but there was a lot of work previously in the community that was not really uh, embraced in the same way. Like Twisted existed for many, many years, and many of the designing principles of async I.O. come from Twisted, but there was, there was a friction between the Twisted community and the core Python community. Um, so these are some areas where I think this, this shows a lot. Um, the packaging story being the biggest one. The, if, you, if you look over packaging the last 15 years, um, the way from you download a zip file with some Python modules and you use what 2018 is virtual env coming from Python, the core language, um, that was a long way. Um, it started with not an, the initial stance of, um, I wouldn't just say the Python core developers, but the community at large at that point was that we don't actually need any distribution, or if we need distribution, this utils is good enough. Just give someone a zip file, and, and it works. Um, but then that evolved to the idea that maybe we need to do more, and so setup tools eventually happened, and setup tools tried to get some metadata into packages. Not necessarily in the best way, but there was an idea behind it that metadata should also live next to Python code. And setup tools didn't get any sort of love from, from, from core Python until very, very late. Um, virtual env was widely rejected together with setup tools as being the wrong way to do um, Python um, package management. And that might be true to some degree, but at least 
the fact that the community actually embraced virtual env meant that there was something in there which surely is solving some people's actual problems. Um, and so now the, there were some projects that came along the way, like Python X, which didn't survive, but they got revived as wheels. Um, and so they are now, I think, generally considered to be the better way to distribute Python code. Um, but the point I want to make is that this was largely community projects happening alongside the Python core language development. And there was very little overlap. Um, the distribution thing is even more telling because none of the systems that currently exist to actually make Python code distributable to end users have anything to do with Python. Py2.exe, which I don't even know is being still maintained, has never moved close to Python, the core language, even though parts to enable it working ended up in, in Python itself. Um, we have Py2, I don't know, app, app files on, on Mac. We have Python 2 RPM packages and all this kind of stuff, but none of those um, use any shared infrastructure. Um, and largely because I think when you, the closer you move to the core language development, you end up seeing that distribution is not a core value of the project. Um, or at least people might say it is, but it really isn't. It's not reflected in, in this. Um, typing, I think, is an, a more interesting case because typing went from we don't want to have any types in the language at all to more and more efforts from the community being put behind enabling type, uh, typing. And now we have the situation where the typing system in core Python is, is one thing, but then what you actually need to use types, MyPy in this case, or some of the other systems that exist, um, are, are not aligned. Um, and they're trying to align it, but this is, this is a case where um, I guess a more holistic approach would also have, have helped. But so why does this happen? Um, and I think there are a bunch of reasons for this. Um, some of them are easy to fix, some of them are harder. Um, the, I, I guess one of the easier things to fix is to, to write down what your core values actually are. Um, but the harder thing to think about is that doing things the right way adds complexity and I think the Python community is fundamentally afraid of it. Um, and this is, this is bizarre because we ended up creating one of the most complex languages possible. Um, but for instance, we, complexity also often means a little bit of friction and pushback from people. And this is not just on a technological level. So for instance, to add um, proper dependency management to Python with installable packages, it would have required a metadata system. It would have required extending the import system. And so this was, I guess, overall deemed to be too complex. Um, this is the same way as typing started out as a very simple thing. Let's just add some signatures to function and see where we go from there. It wasn't, it wasn't considered to build a complex type system because I, I guess it was too complex. Um, but we still create this complexity in other ways. Um, but when you look at non-technological aspects of it, for instance, we have PEP8. Um, and PEP8, I think, is, is, has nothing to do with community. It's just the idea of how to s format code. Um, but there is a part to a PEP which is basically about enforcement. And we never enforce it as a community. We never went in and said, like, you know what? This is how you name a variable. This is how you name a class. This is how you name a, a method. And you're supposed to follow it. And it turns out, not even the Python core language and standard library follows PEP8. We have camel case, we have underscores, we have classes in lowercase, we have everything there. Um, so we, we, we wrote this PEP8 thing, but we were afraid of actually enforcing it. Um, and if you look at language ecosystems that came after us, they, they go quite far in enforcing code styles. So for instance, Rust will, if you name something like camel case method, Rust will say, don't do this. This is a Linter uh, violation. Um, and the, um, the, the channel mode that you have in Go, for instance, is that you run Go format on your code, and it reformats everything to a consistent style guide. And that's just how you do it. End of discussion. And the fact, like, I might not necessarily agree with the design decisions made in certain languages about how they want their function names to, functions to be typed. But there is no discussion anymore. The discussion is gone. It's enforced. Um, whereas this, this how you name your classes and how you put white space and all that sort of stuff is still a fight in the Python community. Um, I can tell you some ecosystems which are very 
very true to their, their naming conventions. We have uh, Twisted with camel case, we have um, like Django Flask with underscores, um, and when you use the code together, it looks very fancy. Uh, um, and I think it's because we, we managed to, and I'm impressed that it works so well, because we managed to really work against each other. Um, I, I, I remember the, the so I was participating in some of the whiskey, how to actually have whiskey work, the, the web server gateway interface for, for Python, and I, I couldn't do it anymore. The, 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 the tone on the mailing list at the time, it was the web sick mailing list, was so hostile, I, I completely gave up on it. Um, I still pushed whiskey forward personally, but I, I never made any proposals anymore for fixing the PEP. Um, I, I remember I, only two years ago, I introduced a small bug fix to whiskey where you could indicate to the, to the, uh, to the framework or the gateway that you can actually read the input stream to an end of file marker. And I didn't want to touch anything anymore. I didn't want to go to a mailing list. I just went directly to people implementing whiskey systems and told them, you know what, just add this attribute there. It's going to fix all your problems. And so we have this informal extension to PEPS 333, mostly because I, I was too afraid of going to the mailing list again. Because I didn't want this, this all this, not necessarily negativity, but this, this the, our lack of civility, I guess, um, in, in dealing with some of these things. Um, so we succeed despite a lot of this. So, but how do we fix it? Um, and I mean, the obvious one is we need to work together better. And I think this is, I'm, I, I don't know why we don't do this, because I go to Python core developers and I go to community members and a lot of them say the same thing, um, but it just doesn't happen. Um, and I think it's because it's like, I guess, in an old marriage that some things are never talked about anymore, that there is actually some fundamental underlying s problems that you just don't talk about anymore. And I think we s should stop being afraid to actually discuss these things. Like, if something doesn't work, um, every once in a while, people will discuss it, and then they will leave the conference, and then that's it. <laughs> I mean, I remember this from non-Python conversations, like non-core Python conversations. I remember this about a couple of years ago when it was about um, trying to see if we can reuse some code between Django and Flask, and it never went anywhere um, because there was an attempt to do it, and then the conference ended, and it was gone. Like, people parted their ways, and, and because it wasn't broken enough, um, there was no need to change it. And I think we are not broken enough that these, this, these, the, the way we discuss things on mailing lists or the way the language is evolving is actually causing us problems. But I think it fundamentally restricts us in what we can do with the language. I think we, we need some sort of vision of what the language should look like, especially now if the leadership of the language, um, like I think the leadership of the language in this case being good, or if, if that person that managed to... Um, to manage this entire uh, like emotional conglomerate of humans underneath to, to get to end direction by being the ultimate voice in, in saying yes or no to something. If that doesn't exist anymore, then we will have uh, a new way to deal with this. And I think primarily we would need to understand as both the core developers and as a community, why do we actually want to go with the language? And it does okay for this vision to be very bold to, to say like we are aspire something which we will probably never reach, but at least by having it as a goal, we can slowly move towards that. Um, and this is something where the the Rust community has is is an amazing example for. And I, I really encourage people that have an interest in community management or something like this to look at what they are doing. Um, so this this could be some things that we might want to investigate, like the idea of working groups in. In Python, a lot of discussions ended with Gudo saying, we do this or we don't do this. Um, in Rust, it's much harder because in Rust, there is not this one person that can make ultimately a decision like this. Maybe in certain subsets, there will be a very trusted developer who can ultimately say that my gut feeling says that between these two almost equivalent proposals, I'm going with B. Um, but for the most part, you have these working groups in Rust which take a topic like network programming or like distribution or WebAssembly, and they will try in their little groups to meet regularly to evolve the idea of, of what it should be that they are working on. Um, 
and this, this brings a lot of transparency to the process. Um, and obviously, it also helps Rust to have a release cadence that's very, very quick. Um, a release goes out every six weeks, which means that if people work in these working groups on features, they will see their results reflected in the real world very quickly. Because if a feature is in the language it might, or it has been distributed with the language, it might be temporarily considered to be an experimental state. So you can only use it with a nightly version of Rust, but it's already there. And people in the community can explore it, can give feedback on it, can say like this works, it doesn't work. Whereas in Python, we basically, our process right now is there's a release once every one and a half years, I think, or something like this. Um, features might be developed over this period of time, or basically thrown over the wall to the community to play with. And then the feedback cycle for actually fixing these things is another one and a half years, at the very least. Um, unless it's actual bugs. But like design problems, like typing, the typing didn't work out the way it's supposed to work out. And it took us from Python 3.0 to 3. Point, well, ongoing, but definitely past 3.7, uh, a process in which it evolves. Um, and so a faster release cadence with individual groups working on individual topics that they're very successful at making decisions on based on their own experience, I think is a very good working model. Um, and it's something that we could try. Um, there's, there's the other question that I think has been lingering in the community for a very long time is about if it's an open source project and so um, I, I shouldn't have to follow the, the, the commands in a way of others. It's, it's my free time. So maybe this is part of our problem. Maybe we should we should actually see if we can get the funds to have full-time developers working on the language to drive the working groups um, so that this, this idea of um, there being a constant conf conflict between um, what, what people actually want to do and what they want to spend their time on and, and, and what actually makes their livelihood um, go away a little bit. Um, I mean, this is a very small thing, but maybe the community wants to start embracing code formatting tools. Um, and lint name violations. Maybe this is going to reduce some of the, of the friction that we have, is that we just say, like, from now on, this is how you name stuff, and we're going to enforce it. I, I wouldn't have a problem with this, but again, I'm just one person. I don't, if, if our goal will be we will not do that, then that can also be something. But right now, we have this desire to follow PEP8, but we are also OK with not following it. So we are very much in the middle. Um, this is sort of my personal thing that I could imagine seeing, that we have some sort of TypeScript approach to typing in Python. I, I love types. I, I love TypeScript. I love Rust for types. Um, I can't work with types in Python. I tried it. It's very hard. It's unless you use, um, especially right now, um, is it called PyCharm? The, you don't really get anything for the type information. It seems to be not even part of the core language to evolve this. I mean, I know that people are trying to do it, but the way typing works in Python right now is the attempt to make typing developed at the same time as the language. Whereas the way TypeScript was developed was that it's a transpiler that takes TypeScript code and compiles it down to JavaScript, which makes it much easier to iterate and improve on the ecosystem, because it's very detached in a way. Um, so maybe this is something that we would want to see. Like Maybe we can get better results in improving our typing story by giving up on the idea that typed code and non-typed code have to be the same syntax. Um, why, why did we never do this? Why, why, do, why do I not just have pip install x and it throws it into .py modules or py modules right next to my project? Why do I have a setup that py file instead of package.json file? Like, maybe it's OK not to have that, but I, I'm programming Python for so many years now, and I don't understand, like, why don't we have that? It seems to be so easy to add. It would solve so many problems. Why? Why all of this complexity around it? And I think primarily because virtual env was not seen as something that belongs part of Python. Nobody wanted to have setup tools in core Python, so you couldn't have any of that metadata stuff in there. So you, it, it didn't go anywhere. But if we say that this is this is how we would want it to be in in, in a couple of years' time, then maybe we could, as a as as the collective of core development and community, say like this is what we want. We we want declarative de de dependencies. Maybe we want multi-versioning, um, but this could be a vision for, for what the language wants to, wants to move to. And then you can have external tools that work with this. Um, maybe this should have happened. I don't know. Maybe it can still happen. This is, this is what I wish we would have done for Unicode, is that everything is UTF-8, non-indexable. It's just a scalar value. It's sitting there. You can have APIs to iterate over things. 
a lot of people say it's too late to change that. I maybe maybe not. Like this is something if if we would make the desire to say like this is. So here's the thing. I, I promise you, if you would do this, like UTF-8 everywhere, even with the performance impact of direct indexing not being workable anymore, you could hack around it to some degree, I think the memory footprint would drop tremendously. Um, the fact that we have UCS4 characters in the interpreter doesn't make any sense. The, 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 highest, the highest character in Unicode can never be above 21 bits, I think, which means that we leave a byte and a bunch of bits unused everywhere. It's we like this is it, it started with an idea of how Unicode should work in Python and it was never challenged. Um, and I just fundamentally disagree with this. It's okay if it turns out I'm wrong on this. Like maybe the way we do Unicode in Python is correct, but there is there's a there's a definite big split between people doing Unicode in the core language versus people using it outside. And Almost everyone I talk to says that this is not a good idea to have UCS4, the character encoding in the language. Maybe we should have started phasing out the C ABI already for an FFI interface. I know that a lot of communities have a problem with this. For instance, the scientific community would, would, would hurt if, if the C ABI would disappear. But if, it's, if you make it a goal to remove the C ABI, then you would find solutions for those communities as well. Maybe it's not a big of a deal, but Right now, it's a lingering thing. A lot of people wish it would be gone. A lot of people tremendously defend it, but there's no conversation happening about this. There's no vision for what the future of the CABI could be. What, what if we would support loading WebAssembly modules? Um, I started a small project to try this, and it actually works. Um, you could compile native dependencies into WebAssembly and then have Python load WebAssembly modules instead of distributing actual native code. Um, maybe this could be the future of, of some of the things. Um, what, what if we actually do try to move into the areas as a, langu as a whole community where, where some people wish we would have gone already to reduce the total amount of stuff in the standard library so we can have a smaller interpreter that can be distributed on smaller and smaller devices? Um, it's also okay that not to be a goal, but this could be one thing that, um, that could become one. Maybe we do multi-versioning of libraries. Maybe I could have a dependency in 1.0 and 2.0 loaded at the same time. Um, if we would make it a goal, we could make it a reality. There is nothing that stops us from doing it. It would obviously require us to have package information in there, in, in the core language, but we could have it. Maybe we want to simplify the object model. Maybe we want to cross-compile the entire thing into WebAssembly. Why, why would I not want to write my web application in Python? Um, it was probably unachievable a couple of years ago, but people compile .NET codes into a browser. People compile um, Go code into a browser. Why would we not try to compile Python code into the browser? I think at this point, we could very much do it. Um, the point I'm trying to make is um, that the part where we didn't execute well on as, as the entire community has been that we didn't really have well communicated vision for the future of the language. And because we didn't have that, um, we had a lot of problems with a lot of friction between different parts of the community interacting, particularly with the core language. And I think now is a historic change, chance to change that, um, because we have this situation that there is no top level leadership at this point. Um, and I think now is also a very good time to to look back at the history of Python and take it to a, to, to a, to a new and brighter future where um, we, we get rid of, like if we get rid of a lot of these friction points that we used to have in the past, I think we could make this a much better language um, than it currently is. And with that, I take questions. Somehow, yeah. Sorry. Any of you who have questions, please come over to the side, and we'll be able to take them. Hello. You can also move over to that side of the stage. It's probably best to, uh, yeah. Outstanding talk. Hello. Um, 
I agree with pretty much everything that you've said. If you were to look at Python core development, of the things you mentioned, which would you see as the top three? I, it's very hard to hear here because of the echo. Um, oh. um, what would you consider the top three things of what you've gone through if the core development team were to take up some of them? Which ones would you want, want most? I think the top three things I would love to be tackled is um, write down any goals right now, even just the current ones, because they're not clearly communicated. It's unclear what it is. So we would need to first understand what is it that the language is being developed for, or what the community wants. Um, I think we would need working groups or a, a good equivalent of them. Um, they have been shown to work. There are many processes by which you can align them. There's OKRs, for instance, can work. Maybe it's overkill for an open source project, but I think it's, it's an established process that can be used. And once people want to give it a try, I think it could work. Um, and then once this sort of groundwork is being done, I think the most important part for evolving the language would be to identify the areas where, like packaging, I think, is, is, is the number one thing that I would identify. But maybe some others have different ideas. But identify the areas where there's the most work to be done, where it's the most, maybe you identify like what makes it hard to use the language to be like the, the primary thing to work on. I think packaging is, packaging slash distribution, those two things, I think that should be the biggest goal because the, the other ecosystems are doing a much better job than us at this point. Um, and in particular, if you, if you try to teach people Python, if you, if you ever have done a, like a, a, a class in Python, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed in how hard this is, especially if I can just put JavaScript right next to it, which is much easier to get going at this point. Um, or, or Rust is also, I, I would, if, if I would do a beginner course in, in programming at this point, I would probably put people to Rust or JavaScript over Python because I know dependencies are necessary. I, I cannot get you going just with printing stuff to the command line. Um, so I think this, this would probably be my top three areas. Uh, hi, Armin. Uh, my name is Rohit. And uh, yeah, this side. Yeah, uh, my name is Rohit, and uh, I want to ask that uh, uh, the thing that we have faced while, you know, when we use, want to use a multi-threading, the, the GIL thing stops us. So any development on that side, or like the, sometime back there's a rumor that, you know, uh, Python is going to remove the GIL. Anything at all here? Um, can you maybe relay the question somehow to me? Please, because please come over here. There's a massive echo. And I, I will repeat the question. Am I audible, Armin? So I would propose I just ask somewhere here in the vicinity because, like, when the microphone goes, I can't hear anything. Yeah. So, so just don't, uh, use the, don't use the microphone. Just ask me. Yeah. <laughs> this is from here. So the question is basically summarized as, I guess, what are my thoughts on multi-threading and the JIL? <laughs> um, test, test, test. Okay. Um, so the the questions are basically, what could I guess the future be for for multi-threading? Let's try this. Hello. Um, so, what, what could the future be for Python for multi threading to chill? Um, so, this I think probably goes back to similar problems is that a lot of people attempted to remove the chill over the years, but it happened outside of the core language development. Um, every attempt to getting rid of the global interpreter lock was one or two people running off trying to remove it. Um, and if it's not the goal of the core language to remove it, it will never be removed because there will be consequences to removing the interpreter lock and they cannot be carried by a small splinter community somewhere in, 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 in some corner. Um, if we want to remove the Jill, 
and I think this would be generally be a desirable goal, we probably as developers will also need to write different code. So we would need to understand that uh, when the jill is gone, the guarantees of the jill are gone, so some of the code which is currently appearing to be multi-threading safe probably won't be it anymore. Um, and so this, it just cannot be done in isolation. I mean, I, I appreciate all the efforts in doing it, but I know they will never be merged. And other than it being hard to remove the jill, if we don't make it a priority, it will just not happen. Um, I did, many years ago, I did an experiment in trying to remove the jill in a very different way, where I didn't remove it. I just wanted to split the interpreter so that you could have multiple Pythons running in the same process with message passing between them. And even just that change would have been so massive that I couldn't have done it on a patch set. It would have to be a core language thing. Um, and I would require actually planning around this to say, like, we're going to attempt over the next 12 years to isolate the internal interpreter friends or the object or something like this to support uh, removing the chill. Just to give, so even if we would never remove the chill, maybe re restructure the internals of the interpreter to eventually support it. So it would have to be a community goal. It can't be, um, it, it can't just be one person somewhere. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear That's me? Right. Yeah. Uh, great talk. Uh, I, I, have two, I have two questions. First of all, uh, when you talk about Puppet enforcement, uh, I think uh, Python is, for most of the people here, is also a go-to language. It's a Swiss army knife that they use for, to write a few scripts or something like that. So what is your take on that, that Python is not just, like Python, obviously we are using commercially, but if I talk about a Swiss army knife or a language that will be my go-to language if I want to write a, a script in five minutes. Hey, can you come here? I'm just yeah. already losing that part again. It's very hard to hear here. Um, so the, the first question was like, if, if we would enforce PEP8, would not have downsides because it would slow down people, for instance, for making scripts. Um, I, I think, like my opinion on PEP8 doesn't really matter. It's what the community would say. Um, I personally think that I would probably enforce it in the sense that it would give you massive warnings if you try to name something in, in inconsistent ways. You don't have to enforce how you have your white space, but well, you would have to enforce the naming conventions. Because if you don't enforce the naming conventions, they will never be followed. Um, so yeah, I, there's a cost to any enforcement. Um, if the community wants to do it, it's a different question. But right now, we have this idea of enforcing it without the enforcement, and that just doesn't seem sensible. Uh, so the only one question. So we are uh, less than time. We'll, this is the last question that we are going for. If you have any more questions, please uh, find Armin off stage, and you can ask a question. Hello, I didn't, I didn't quite get the. Pu okay, so the question was, what's, uh, what's stopping the community from just running pep eight once on the code and be done with it? Um, what, what stops people from doing it is that I, I mean, I care to some degree how it's formatted, but I think what I care most about is like how the function names are named, and you can't just name, rename everything now because it would break too much API. Um, so that's the short version of it. You can't just do it now. Um, the, the synchronization effort of doing this would be too great. Um, but I, in a way, I regret that even having PEP8 to be part of this talk because I don't think it's like relevant overall. I think it's, it, it would be important that we start to embrace the ideas to, to write down what could be our ideas. And PEP8 is one of the things that's just written down. And we should figure out if this is something we care about. I would care about it, but maybe the community at large doesn't. Um, and so that would be valid as well. All right, thank you very much.